My name is Paul, and I'm one of the pastors here at Copper Hills. I just want to say welcome, and welcome to all of you who are at home watching online. And for those of you online, man, did you miss out on an amazing 15 to 20 minutes just then, right? How awesome is it? I just so much enjoyed sitting in the, the front row over here just worshiping Jesus with you guys. That was awesome. And last service and this service, it's been such a reminder to me that it's not about me and it's not about my stuff and my world and all that's going on in my life. I love this opportunity that we get every week to gather together, to put ourselves aside and to lift up Jesus Christ. We do that every single week and even more so here in this Christmas season. This is an awesome opportunity to not just hear when we gather, but everywhere you go, worship the name of Jesus. So thank you so much for just joining with me and making me feel like I was part of such an amazing group this morning. Thank you. Well, if you look behind me, you see it says, lead us. We're in week three of a series that Brad and I have been talking about this idea of who is really leading us during this Christmas time of year. The last two weeks, Brad and I have been looking at Matthew chapter two, and today we're going to look at a different section of scripture. But as I was thinking about this whole idea of this Christmas season, I always oftentimes am reminded about all the traditions that go with Christmas. You know what I'm talking about? So many traditions. In fact, I remember when I first got married, my wife and I, and we were getting ready to have our first Christmas together, and we encountered this difficulty of, are we going to follow a lot of the traditions of my side of the family? Or are we going to follow the traditions of her side of the family? The very first one we had to tackle was the idea of the Christmas tree. Is it going to be live or is it going to be dead in her mind? <laughs> is it going to be fake? You see, my wife's family was live Christmas tree. My, love, my wife loves the smell of a fresh Christmas tree. My family, however, we just had a one that we would set up and tear down a fake Christmas tree every year. Out of curiosity... How many of you in here are, your family tradition is live Christmas tree, real live Christmas trees? How many of you are like my family, fake Christmas tree? Wow, my wife's sitting over here in the audience and I wonder what she thinks about knowing that you're all, most of you are, no, I know. But it's just simple stuff like that, these traditions. Isn't it amazing? In fact, take a quick minute. This was interesting in the first service to talk about this. Take a minute. Turn and face the people next to you and talk briefly about these Christmas traditions. What traditions are super important to you? What traditions are kind of unique to your family? Share those with the people sitting around you. You've got about one minute to talk about Christmas traditions. Go for it. Well, I can, I can always tell we've struck a, a nerve and hit a good question when that much talking is going on. That was amazing. A lot of talking out there. Like Just one more example from our own life. When I was growing up, the tradition in our family was we opened almost all of our presents on Christmas Eve, and then on Christmas morning, we got our stockings. That was the difference. Yeah, I know there's some of you that are like, you were like my wife's family. You thought like we were the worst Christians in the world. Like in her family, you don't open up anything until Christmas morning. That's when it happens. Yes. And so these traditions, they're a big deal, right? You can tell there's some people that are jumping up out of their seats. Like, no, there's a right way and a wrong way to do this stuff. And all of these traditions have even gripped me about the idea of Jesus's birth and this story that we're telling it's interesting that in the Bible, there's a ton of information about the end of Jesus's life. All four of the gospel writers talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. They all talk about it. They all give a lot of detail. There's multiple chapters around it. But Jesus's birth is only talked about by two of the four gospel writers, and it's just given a very little bit of information. And there's this 
tradition that we've always been told all our life that Jesus was born on December 25th in the year zero, right? Like his birth flipped the entire calendar. It went from what it was before to after him. And I grew up almost all of my life just assuming that and believing that and not really studying it and thinking much about it until I was in my 40s. And I started to do a little research and like, wait a minute, there's some information and stuff out there that maybe makes me believe that Jesus wasn't born on December 25th on year zero. What do I do with that? Is this tradition a good tradition? Is it a bad tradition? And, and then I started to think to myself, I've never heard anybody preach a sermon on when was Jesus actually born? Everybody's just always assumed it was December 25th. And so about 10, 15 years ago, I started doing more study, more research, and I was really just interested in this. And so Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. Like, Paul, are you going to ruin Christmas for us? Is that what you're doing right now? I'm here to let you know that he might have been. There's a one in 365 <laughs> chance that he was born on that day. So there is a chance. It is possible. But most all scholars or researchers would say he probably wasn't born on December 25th. I'm not here to kill Christmas. I'm not here to ruin the season. I love Christmas. I love celebrating Jesus on December 25th. I also love celebrating Jesus on every other day as well. But the bottom line is this. What if we actually let, instead of tradition lead us, what if we let God's word lead us? What if in God's word, maybe we tried to see, what does it say about the birth of Jesus? And, and just to kind of be really clear, the Bible doesn't say he was born on December 25th. It doesn't say what day he was born. It's not specific. So for many of us, like myself, for the first 40 years of my life, I thought, because it doesn't necessarily say specifically, then why bother? Why look at it? Just celebrate it whenever you want. But as I've gotten older, I've kind of actually been more intrigued by it. And I've thought to myself, I'd kind of actually like to see if the Bible does say anything about this. And so now I've tried to actually try to care, to see, not to be divisive or to act like I'm right, but just I've had kind of a desire to know what does God's word say about all this? So what I'd like you to do is join with me over the next few moments as we go into scripture and we look at scripture a little bit differently. Instead of looking at it as a story, we maybe look at it in a little bit different way. What do I mean? If you have your Bibles, open up to the, the book of Luke. And we're gonna start off in Luke chapter one. A lot of these verses are gonna be up on the screen. So be prepared to listen to me to read a lot of scripture and you to follow along with a lot of scripture. But we're going to start at the beginning of Luke's gospel because he tells us why and how he's writing it from the very beginning. <clears throat> Here's how it begins. Luke says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So right away we see here that Luke is saying, I'm not just trying to just tell the story of Jesus. Yes, that's what I'm doing, but I actually have been studying this meticulously. I have been investigating this. I've been talking to eyewitnesses, people like Jesus's brother and sisters, Jesus's mom, all of his friends and followers. I've been talking to all of them, gathering as much detail and information as I can. And now I'm gonna present it to you in a detailed, orderly account so that you can know that this stuff that I'm writing is true. It's legitimate. This is how it really happened. And so for, for once, I want you to maybe not just read these next few verses as a story, which is an amazing story. And we read these passages of scripture every year on Christmas in our family. But I want you to read it with a little bit more of an eye for the detail and the things that, like me, I normally skipped in my early years and just kind of passed by that and thought, I don't know what that name means or that, that, that place is. And so that's not going to be a big deal to me. So let's give that a try. So let's continue on in Luke chapter one, verse five. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. 
but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. So for me, I've always been focused on the last verse, like the story part. There's the cool part of the story. This guy, Zachariah, his wife, Elizabeth, they weren't able to have kids. They were very old. Something miraculous is about to happen. And I didn't pay much attention to some of the other stuff. Like for instance, in that first verse there in verse five, it gives us details about Zachariah, specifically that he was a priest and that he, did, that he was a part of a very specific division of the priests. And again, for 40 years, I never paid attention to that, didn't look much into that. As I've been looking into it, there's something significant that Luke is trying to tell us there. He's trying to give us some detail for a reason. Well, if we go back into the Old Testament, which we're gonna do from time to time this morning together, and we go to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 24, in verses one through 19, it gives us the list of these priestly divisions that all served in the temple. And they did it in a very orderly way. There was a system for it. So let me read just some of those verses from 1 Chronicles 24. These were the divisions of the descendants of Aaron. The first lot fell to a guy with the name J, the seventh to a guy with the name H. I'm skipping some of them. The eighth to Abijah. There's our guy, Abijah. Zechariah is a descendant of this guy and his lot fell in the eighth slot. Then it says the ninth and then it skipped all the way to 24. So what it tells us is there were 24 slots. Each slot represented a week. So each one of these priests, someone from their priestly tribe, not all of them, one would be picked each week and they would serve. And there was an order to it. If you were from this tribe, you were first, so on and so forth. Zacharias was eight. That means he was eight weeks into the calendar year. So eight weeks from the beginning of the year, that's when he would serve. And there were 24 cycles. So we know in our calendar, we have 52 weeks. The Jewish calendar was more like 48 weeks. And so there would be 24 and then they would repeat. So there would be two times a year when Zacharias' tribe, one person from their division would have the opportunity to serve in the temple. That's what verse 19 says. This was their appointed order of ministering when they entered the temple of the Lord, according to the regulations prescribed for them by their ancestor Aaron, as the Lord, the God of Israel had commanded them. So God had set up this system, the descendants of Levi, and then later through Aaron, they were all from the same tribe. They would then have these opportunities to serve in the temple. So kind of hold on to that information. We're gonna look at it more in just a minute. Now let's go back into the Luke account in Luke chapter one. We're now gonna be in verse eight. Once when Zachariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So in the story, it's telling us that Zechariah, one time, he was given the opportunity from his group of people, we don't know how many there were, but he got the chance to go in and do this very special thing that only the priest was allowed to do. And so we, we know it was either in his first eight-week stint or it was in the second eight-week stint, which would have been 24 plus eight, 32 weeks into the calendar year. Verse 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, this is Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John. Who is this John? This John will later become John the Baptist. And we'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute. Verse 16, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Continuing on in verse 23. When his time of service was completed, <clears throat> he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. So here through Luke's orderly detailed account, we can now pinpoint that Zachariah's son, John the Baptist, was conceived right after he left his appointed time to serve in the temple. Shake your head if this is making sense. 
So we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that's what Luke was saying. And we know that that had to be probed almost likely one of two times, either in the first eight-week cycle when he got to eight, or then later in the 32-week cycle when it had completed 24 and then added the next eight. So it's almost certainly one of those two times when Zachariah was in the temple, right after that, his wife miraculously becomes pregnant. That's John the Baptist. Next bit of information. Chapter one, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, otherwise, like, why would he be telling us? Why, why do we care about how long someone was pregnant? Is this information relevant or important to the story? For a long time, I thought it wasn't. Now I actually think it is. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. This is the part of the story we know. This is where Joseph and Mary come into the story. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Verse 34, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then the angel says this, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. It's as if the angel was saying, I know this sounds ridiculous. I know this sounds crazy, miraculous, like this doesn't happen. This isn't how babies are born. But I want you to know that you have a relative that something amazing and unexpected and not normal just happened to her. He's it's as if God is saying, this, this is unique, this is special, but it is plausible, it is possible. In the same way that you're gonna have a special child, so is your relative, Elizabeth. Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be to me, to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. So here's where we do a little bit of kind of mathematics. And here's where it's so helpful that there's a consistent pattern. You know, the consistent pattern for human beings to be born is about a nine month process, roughly give or take. There's obviously babies that are born a little earlier and babies that are born a little later, but generally speaking, that's the process. We know that. And so if we can kind of just look at these dates that Luke has given us for John the Baptist's birth and apply them to Jesus's birth, maybe we can come up with a pretty good idea of when Jesus was born. Maybe not the exact day, but maybe we can come up with a time period that would make sense. And so basically, if we do the math, we can see that Jesus was conceived in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And therefore he was born six months after his relative, John the Baptist was born. So did you catch that? Conceived, six months into Elizabeth's pregnancy, and then he was born six months after John the Baptist was born. And I think that's why Luke told us about what division Zechariah was a part of and when he was serving. So John the Baptist was conceived during Zechariah's temple duty, which was only twice a year at a specific time. And that's what we said. He would have been serving in the temple in one of those times, week eight or week 32, which either would have been in the spring or it would have been in the fall. So that's an important piece of information that it appears that's in here. And we can kind of take notice of that, take interest of that and see how that applies to the story. Now, one other thing that's been very interesting to me over the last 10, 15 years of my life of studying scripture is I really didn't have a huge like for the Old Testament when I was younger. 
I was much more focused on the New Testament. But now I've really seen the beauty of both of the Testaments as they come together. And I've come to see that God was preparing not only the Israelites, but all of humanity for his coming Messiah. He was giving us signs. He was giving us um, examples ahead of time so that we would not miss the coming of his son, Jesus. There's these specific feasts or festivals that God appointed for the Jews to observe. And these were a big deal. They were to observe these every year, no matter what. And they were at very specific times of the year. I personally had never like celebrated or even really paid attention to many of these festivals until the last few years. So I wanna show you what these festivals are. <clears throat> they're first mentioned in the book of, well, not first, but the main place where they're all listed out is in Leviticus chapter 23, starting in verse one. Leviticus 23, one, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed festivals or feasts, the appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. And then he goes on to list them all out. So instead of reading all of those, what I wanna do is show them to you kind of visually. If you look at the screen right now, here's a diagram that helps us understand when the Jewish feasts or festivals are, how they're located in the Jewish calendar and how they're located in our calendar. You see the spring feast, the fall feast, and then one other feast or festival called Pentecost. Around the circle in yellow are the months of the year in the Jewish calendar. That's their name for those months. They follow a more of a lunar calendar. We follow a little bit more of a solar combination lunar calendar that's more Western that the Romans kind of were one of the first ones to come up with. And so you can see our months are in blue in the middle and you see how they correlate to the Jewish months on the outside. A couple of things to understand. See where it says spring feast and then it says Nisan. Although Nisan, that start of that month is in the spring, according to um, the seasons, Nisan was considered the start of the spiritual calendar for the Jewish people because in the month of Nisan was one of the most significant events in their history occurred, which was the Passover. So for the Jews, they had a spiritual new year, which was in Nisan, and then they had a political or governmental or commerce new year, which was earlier than that, which would have been right around our January in between Tevet and Shavat right there. That would have been around the time when their new year started for more of a political time frame. So these feasts, let's talk a little bit more about them. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. Moses writes, three times a year, all of your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Festival or Feast of Weeks, and the Festival of Tabernacles. No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. So if we go back to the, the diagram again, we notice that God set these festivals or feasts up in sets of kind of like three different time periods. And in each one of the time periods, all of the males were required to go back to Jerusalem to celebrate that. So in the spring, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits were all kind of one right after another. And during that time, all the men and everyone, if you could, was supposed to go back to visit Jerusalem. Next was Pentecost. They were all supposed to go back. And then once in the fall, around the same time of the feast or festival of tabernacles. So is that significant? Why were there these three times they had to all go back? Why did he separate them into those three areas? Here's some of the things that we already know about these feasts that no one kind of argues or debates about. First of all, Passover. Everyone agrees that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection occurred during Passover and those other times. Almost everyone believes that that's when it happened. There's no argument about that. Next, the Holy Spirit came during the time of Pentecost, and we'll go back to the picture in just a minute. And so, and so if something very significant happened at Passover, something significant at Pentecost, maybe something significant was also supposed to happen during the, uh, the other time. So go back to the picture. In the fall, we don't know if something has happened yet there or not. Passover, just to remind you of what Passover was. This was the significant event where the Jewish people were freed by God from Egypt as slaves. And how did it happen? In the very end, the last plague was the death of the firstborn son of everyone, whether you were Egyptian or whether you were Jewish. And so God said to protect your firstborn sons, here's what you're to do. You're to take a lamb, a perfect lamb, 
You're to then kill that lamb, take its blood and put it on the doorposts and the side parts of your door. Put blood on the doorposts and the side of the door, the blood of a lamb to protect you. Is that making sense? That's what happened at Passover. Does that look familiar to anything? When Jesus Christ died on a cross, there was blood on a cross. He was called the lamb of God that was sacrificed. Do you see the symbolism? No one in Jesus' day would have missed that. They would have understood. You're saying that Jesus was the Passover lamb. You're connecting something very significant in Jesus's life, his death, burial, and resurrection to these spring feasts. Pentecost, if you look in the book of Acts chapter two, this is after Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection, 50 days later, this significant event that the Jews celebrated all the time was Pentecost. And it was at Pentecost where the Holy Spirit came upon everyone. This is where the Holy Spirit was now accessible to everyone. So a significant event in the life of Jesus or God was at Passover, at Pentecost. So what if maybe another significant event was at this time of tabernacles, atonement, and trumpets? Well, the Feast of Tabernacles, it literally means that God is dwelling with us. Before they ever built a temple, the Israelites had a tabernacle. Think of it as a tent a temporary structure that they believed God dwelled or lived in that, and it would move around with them as they were traveling. But the point was, God, that's where God is located on earth. That's where God lives, in the tabernacle. And so in the Feast of Tabernacles, they celebrate that even to this day by going out and living in temporary structures, like a tent-like structure, to try to remember that event. So have that in your mind as we talk a little bit about now the story of Luke chapter two as we get specifically into what we know as the Christmas story. So go back to your Bibles, Luke chapter two, starting in verse one. Luke writes, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And then in parentheses, this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria and everyone went to their own town to register. Luke goes out of his way to tell you Here's who the ruler of the entire Roman world was at that time. That's so helpful because we know even outside of the Bible, everyone believes that Caesar Augustus lived, that he was a real person. And we know the exact times from not just the Bible, but from outside sources, Roman history and all kinds of history, when Caesar Augustus lived. So that gives us a very easy window to picture Jesus was born sometime in that window. Then he gives us even more detail telling us that not only was it the the king of the entire kind of known world at that time, but even a localized governmental leader, a guy named Quirinius, when he was around, something took place at that time so we could even further pinpoint when Jesus was born. So that's how you can see Luke is giving us a tremendous amount of detail that most of us, when we read the story, we skip these names. We don't know that dude. We just want to get to the baby being born in the manger. That's the next part of the story. Verse four. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So another little bit of information, no guest room available. Is that normal? Why would there not be any room available? Because there had to have been a whole bunch of people that were coming into an area that wouldn't normally be there. Think of it as like all of our major holidays. That's when you're traveling and it's hard to get a hotel room or an Airbnb because everybody is traveling at the same time. So when were the three major times that they were traveling? We saw that, those three festivals They would go and they would travel during those times. And population would swell in Jerusalem and the outside areas. Bethlehem was only five miles away from Jerusalem. So it could be that there was no room because it was the time of one of those three festivals. And it could also be because everybody was having to go to register where their hometown was. So either one of those ideas seems to fit with why there's no room for them. Verse eight, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. 
An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all of the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And again, that's where my mind has always gone. The last verse, Jesus, baby, manger. That's the story part of it. The story I remember, I tell. And I've never questioned verse eight. Like the shepherds were living in their fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And then as other people were talking to me about this as I was researching it, it was like, wait a minute, there's only certain times of the year that shepherds actually stay outside with their flocks at night. I didn't realize that. I didn't know that that wouldn't be a year round thing. So I know it's not super cold here in December, but how many of you would want to stay outside in December all night long and sleep? Probably not most of us. We wouldn't go in the backyard and sleep with our dogs, cats, or if you have lambs, you wouldn't do that. And it's pretty much the same way in the Middle East, specifically in the Jerusalem, Bethlehem area. It would not be normal for shepherds to stay outside in the cold weather with their flocks. It wouldn't be good for them and it wouldn't be good for their flocks. They would bring them in every night, bring them back into a warm place or in a pen, and then they would go and sleep in a place that was warmer as well. So that one verse alone seems to lead us to believe that Jesus probably was not born in the winter time. Again, it's like, crud, Paul, you're ruining December 25th for us here. But according to that information, it's not likely. Is it possible? Sure, it's possible, but probably not. What else is significant about the shepherds staying out in the fields all night? This was usually done in the spring and in the fall. And then also, I didn't realize that lambs are really just born in one specific time of the year. I assume that the way we have kids and children every, all the time, and it's all pretty much equal and spread out, lambs are really only born in mostly one specific time of the year. It's called the lambing season, and this is in February and March. And so if that's the case, if that's the typical normal time for lambs to be born, it would make sense that shepherds would stay in the fields so that they could make sure that the new baby lambs were born healthy and everything went according to plan. And if that's the case, then that was probably in the late February, early March timeframe. But it could have also, they, they would have been outside probably in spring or fall. I know it's a lot of information. Are you with me still? Hopefully I haven't lost you. Okay. So few more verses in the Luke account, and then we'll kind of wrap this all up and put it all together. Verse 13, suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on peace on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things up and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all of the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So again, let's go back to the picture of the festivals. So when you put all of this information together, when you take into account Jesus's relative, John the Baptist and his birth, and how that fits into when Jesus was born. When you figure in the shepherds being out in the fields at night, when you figure in that there was no room for them in the inn, all of this information mostly points to one of two time periods. And that is either in the fall or in the spring, spoiler alert, not in the winter, not December 25th. So am I saying that we need to stop celebrating Christmas in December and move it to one of the other times? Yes. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> what I'm saying is let's just at least try to read our Bibles, try to let the Bible guide us, and then acknowledge that. I'm still going to celebrate Christmas in December. I think you can as well. But it also is an idea to realize that maybe we shouldn't always be following and be led by tradition as much as we're led by the Bible. So in my opinion, it was probably either in the spring or in the fall. And I think one of the key components to that 
is the one festival that hasn't been attached to anything yet, and that's the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, the idea of this tabernacle, the tabernacle was created because before the tabernacle, God did not dwell with the humans on earth anywhere. And he said, now I will have a place that you can come visit me and experience me in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was before the temple. And so it was God saying, I'm coming to earth. I'm dwelling with you. Isn't that exactly what Jesus's birth is all about? God's saying, I'm coming to earth. In fact, although John, the writer John, not John the Baptist, didn't write about Jesus's birth, he did tell us kind of the beginning of the whole story. And in John chapter one, verse 14, he says this, the word, meaning Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. The word dwelling there literally means tabernacled. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us, lived among us, dwelt with us, came to be with us. And so in my opinion, it probably means that either Jesus was born around the time of the Feast of the Tabernacles, which was in the fall, or he was born in the spring around the time the original tabernacle was created. Do we know when the original tabernacle started? We actually do. In the book of Exodus chapter 40, verses one and two, it said, then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting on the first day of the first month. He gave us the exact time the tabernacle started. It was day one of their spiritual year, which was the month of Nisan. If you wanna go to that picture again, one more time, that picture, Nisan one, was the spiritual new year when the spiritual calendar started over. 15 days later would be Passover. And so if it happened then, it was this idea that God was saying in the same way that I'm coming to dwell with you and start something new, maybe that's when the whole new year will occur as well. So in my opinion, doesn't mean I'm right, but probably Jesus was born during Feast of Tabernacles or Nisan day one, which was like the beginning of a whole new year. Another just little interesting thing, they say that from the time Moses was given the idea of the tabernacle up on Mount Sinai to the time he completed the tabernacle and it actually came into existence was about nine months. Like how long it takes for a human to be born, like conception to birth, interesting. So all that information is hopefully something new. I had never heard a sermon preached on that. If you have, hopefully it was better than this one. (laughs) If not, now you've heard a sermon about the birth of Jesus, what the Bible says about the information. The goal now is not just to go, oh, that was cool, that was interesting, and go on. The whole idea of not just this week, but the entire series is to say, who and what is leading us? Is it tradition? Is it ourselves? Is it people in our life? Or is it God and ultimately God through his word, scripture? So what I want to encourage you to do is absolutely read the Christmas story this season. Enjoy the story. Tell about the story. Celebrate the wise men, the shepherds, the manger, the possible animals, everything that happened. But if you also are interested, take some time to read it in a different way not as a story, but as information, as details, so that you can understand when these things may have occurred. So my goal would be for you and for your families, enjoy the story of Jesus this season, but also read it from a new, fresh perspective. Study it, have a hunger and thirst for God's word and let it lead you. Would you join me in prayer? Dear God, we are so thankful for the Bible. We're so thankful for all of it, all the stuff in the Old Testament that points to your son, Jesus, the clues, the ideas that you were giving us so that we could not miss when you chose to dwell among us, to live with us in human form as your son, Jesus. I'm so thankful that these gospel writers gave us details and gave us information about this so that we can study it, so we can think about it, so we can pray about it. And then ultimately, so we can share it with people around us. And I pray that we would share the story of Jesus with confidence 
knowing maybe not exactly when he was born, but knowing that he was born and he was probably born in a pretty specific time period in the history of mankind. And so God, ultimately, we just want you to know that we love you and we worship your son, Jesus. We give him all of the glory, the honor, the praise that he deserves this time of year, as well as every single day of the year. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. All right, go out and read the story of Jesus and share the story of Jesus with others. Thank you.